over the decades since the beach closed in the 60s, uh, people in the community have over and over rediscovered the beach. I've heard about people hosting punk rock concerts out there in the 90s. Uh, I think the most recent wave of activism and discovery, uh, like Bliss talked about in 2020, um, wish we had time for Sage Michael and, and others to talk about uh, their kind of entry into this amazing space. Um, but just want to highlight uh, in June of that year, um, the activists on this call founded New Orleans for Lincoln Beach. And then at the end of that year, heading into 2021, the city uh, formed the Lincoln Beach Community Advisory Committee, which has been meeting regularly since. And the next meeting is August 3rd. Um, in 2021, the city hired uh, digital engineering to conduct a site assessment. Um, and I'll show some images of what that looks like if you haven't looked at it before. And then in 2022, knowing that the city was going to put out a RFQ or an RFP, a request for proposals um, for a master plan, uh, New Orleans for Lincoln Beach reached out again to water leaders and we worked together on facilitating a community visioning process to make sure that there was a community vision in place before any formal work happened by outside design firms or planning entities. Um, earlier this year, the city released the RFQ, that's the request for qualifications in order to select a team uh, later this summer um, to create a Lincoln Beach redevelopment master plan, which will guide uh, over $24 million in public investments. <clears throat> that master plan will, uh, will determine which projects are funded um, and in what 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 sequence, what comes first, what's the top priority, what's the second priority. Um, the currently, the city is also working with a firm called Digital Engineering, the same firm that did the site assessment, to uh, do some initial improvements, such as reestablishing utilities, uh, improving the entrance tunnel, uh, demolishing unsafe buildings and uh, shoreline protection, a couple of different things. These are also listed in the RFQ. Um, the selected team to create the Lincoln Beach Redevelopment Master Plan is required to conduct a minimum of six public hearings or meetings as part of their process and to com uh, incorporate that community input into the master plan. And then from there, uh, this would be my assumption, but the city would, uh, if we think about a timeline, master planning processes usually take uh, it could take anywhere from six months to a year, um, and it's going to be different depending on the team. Um, but the city will then hire additional firms to develop individual projects um, and priorities that are outlined in the master plan, and then hire contractors to, to do the work. Um, these are just a couple of images from that initial site assessment, which um, was trying to answer questions of what are some ways of improving entry into the beach um, and how much might that cost? Uh, is it a $2 million project? Is it a $10 million project to build a bridge or a crosswalk? Uh, what are some of the initial possibilities? This doesn't take into account the beach as a whole. Um, and so it, it, it's just an initial assessment of what's possible with reopening the site. In the fall, of 2022. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail, but this was a community visioning process where over 100 people, many of them on the call today, uh, contributed to the development of a community vision. And then this is the RFQ um, that the city released um, back in June. And I just wanted to highlight two, a couple of things from the RFQ process. Um, you can see in the introduction, this is what the city thinks is possible. Recreation, ecotourism, education, historic preservation, and events are potential uses for the city of New Orleans um, that, that the city of New Orleans envisions for the new Lincoln Beach. Um, and then down below, the uh, I highlighted the part that talks about the work that is currently ongoing. The ongoing design project has a focus on restoring consistent access to the site by an improved entrance tunnel, so on and so forth. So that's the stuff that's already happening. And then if you go to exhibit A or attachment A in the RFQ, um, you can see what the master planning team that's selected would be doing. Um, the part that's most directly relevant to community engagement is, is here. One, the master planning team is asked to look at um, 
the community vision and also the site assessment along with other documents. And then here under C, the master planning team is required to facilitate a public input process and engage residents in formulating and implementing a plan that truly belongs to community utilizing so on and so forth. And so what is a master plan exactly? These are a few images from a master plan that um, uh, my colleagues and I at Civic Studio were able to contribute to, um, master plan for UNO. You might see images like this, where in this case, uh, it identifies buildings, existing buildings at UNO, and then also some new buildings that might be constructed. It's a way of looking ahead into the future, saying even if we don't have all the money to achieve uh, 20 million or 30 or $50 million worth of improvements, um, what are things that we can do in the next five years? What are things we can do in the next 10 years, 20 years? At the same time, it's also a chance to think about all the different forces acting on a site. So in the top right, UNO is situated at the lakefront. So as part of the planning process, we're looking at the different forces of water acting on, uh, acting on the levees and the lakefront. Um, you might see diagrams uh, describing different things like circulation. And you would probably also see renderings like the one in the bottom right showing and visualizing what a place might look like. So these are all typical components of a master plan. Um, and I think the, the, the question is, is always how, how, how well is the community integrated into that process of um, conducting the research, of developing the big ideas, and articulating what the future of a place, whether it's a campus or a beach or an entire city, what that future might look like. Um, and so again, we want to get out ahead of this. Uh, top left are a lot of uh, some of the team members that, that really help pull together the, the um, community visioning process. And then um, the, this is a report which is available publicly online. I can share links to all of the stuff um, afterwards helpful, um, but this is what we delivered to the city at the end of last year. Um, and we want to make sure that this stuff was in writing and the contributions, the ideas, um, and, and the ideas shared by over 100 people would be part of this formal process. Um, in the report, we talked briefly about the context of uh, Lincoln Beach, um, both its deeper history in terms of being a wetland, but then also its more recent history as a historic black space. Um, the, we put forth through the visioning process, um, these overly simplistic ideas in the bottom right of what the, what, what the beach might become with examples. Um, we heard loud and clear, there's no, no interest in, in this place becoming like a resort or an amusement park. We captured data and ideas in a lot of different ways. We started first and foremost with um, with sharing food and conducting story circles and using that as a starting point for thinking about shared values for community vision. Um, we hosted a couple of different design workshops and used large models and collaging techniques and drawing, uh, drawing tools in order for people to create drawings like the one you see in the bottom right. Um, we exhibited some of this work at Miss Janet's uh, Lincoln Beach Center um, and created more opportunities for people to take part there. And we also conducted an online survey. So those who were unable to make the in-person events were able to continue to share their thoughts. We collected all that information from these different activities and tried to capture um, some key ideas around what people see this site being used for, uh, whom the beach is for, and why, why this place is important. So you can see, for example, the importance of history and culture um, to any future development of the site, um, or that recreation is the top, uh, the top desired use. So in the top right are some of the values that were identified um, to guide future planning processes. And then the bottom, we were able to highlight this key tension that arises where, uh, where in the past, um, Lincoln Beach was more of a was more of an amusement park, but also what we love so much about what it is today are the sunsets, the the forest, the beach, and the more natural environment. And so, how do you kind of balance?
uh, those those different visions for what the beach can become. Um, we analyzed all the drawings that were created, the model and the drawings, and we identified a couple of design principles. I'm not going to go into it today, but um, the, the kind of final diagram that we include in this community vision is the idea that we need to leave as much of the forest there as possible, but we can carve out zones of activity um, so that what, regardless of how densely activated this site is, you always feel like you're amongst the trees. And so you can see this doesn't say exactly what happens in an activity zone. It's simply a set of ideas about how to find that balance between forest and development between water and land. Yeah, Lauren, would you mind kicking us off? Yeah, absolutely. Good, e good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Lauren Awashi. Thank you so much for the invite to be here. And what I'm going to strive to very briefly talk about <laughs> are some ideas around building community power in public spaces and show you some um, an example of how we do that at the organization I work at, which is called KDI. And so, you know, just a little bit about who we are. We're a community design and development nonprofit. I'm based in Los Angeles, but we have um, we have offices sort of internationally, and we work to collaborate with disinvested places that have been excluded or otherwise marginalized by traditional and design you know, traditional design and planning practices. We do that through landscape architecture, such as building parks, planning, advocacy, and community organizing. And I'll show you how all of those things come together in the way that we approach our projects, which is actually quite similar to how Aaron was talking about the process y'all have been going through for Lincoln Beach. And within that, all of the design and decision-making that we do is done in deep collaboration and partnership with community members. That's everything from figuring out what the project should be, how to fund it, what it should look like, how it should operate, how it should feel, and how it really integrates into the culture and communities that we're working in. And I can talk about this a little bit further in the breakout room that I'll be part of. So we think of public spaces not just as the green, the trees, the physical pieces of it, the soccer fields, but really how can you bring a social layer to that, a space for community gathering, for community stories, for building community power and leadership capacity, and also as a way to bring uh, economic development and how you can really use public space to help folks that are um, struggling from an economic perspective um, bring in more income. And I'll talk about how these three sort of overlay in um, a very different context from New Orleans in the Eastern Coachella Valley, which is 120 degrees, I'm going tomorrow. Um, and it's about two and a half hours east of Los Angeles, really close to the Mexico-Arizona border. It's an area that's mostly agricultural and it really lacks a lot of basic infrastructure. There's um, a lack of sidewalks, a lack of drinking water, of really um, equitable housing. And before the project I'm about to talk about, um, a lack of recreational spaces. Most folks would have to drive about 45 minutes to be able to get to the closest park to them. And because many folks are undocumented, they have almost no formal political power. And though they're a really organized, vibrant, strong community, there wasn't that connection to decision makers and how to actualize what they wanted to see in their communities. And so in the community of North Shore, folks really talked about how they wanted a public space, like a recreational space for their kids to push it forward. And the parks department was interested, but all they wanted to do was show up, put a soccer field down and call it a day. And so we, through some external funding, went through an entire process of the community visioning that was just talked about. What do people want the spaces to look like? How do they function? What's really important? And not just about how it looks, but how you can really build in community power and growth to that and make it a space that is, um, usable for the culture, the celebrations, and how they saw their community and what that visioning process looks like. And so I'm not going to lie, it took us five years. It was, there were some ups, there were some downs. Uh, we were on the good side and the bad side of the parks department. But um, 
through that, we ended up with this really beautiful, vibrant park that people love and see themselves in. It has everything from, you know, a community gathering space, playground, skate park, et cetera. But it's not only about those pieces. It's really about showing how the community vision directly translated both into the design, but also the operations and the, the sort of life of this space. To talk a little bit about the economic piece too, is that, you know, there was this really strong group of women that would come to all of our workshops. And through having conversations with them, they said, you know, a recreational space is going to be awesome for our kids, for our families, et cetera. But what would be really transformational for us is to be able to take the informal businesses that they had selling tamales out of the back of their truck um, and turn that into an income stream that would make them independent from their spouses or their husbands. So we worked with them to create a business plan for a women-led community um, food vending co-op that now has a physical space at this park and is helping them bring in additional income that they otherwise wouldn't have had uh, without this park space. And so to wrap it up, what we really saw as part of this park was not just the creation of a single public space, but really this community um, leadership capacity and um, space at a decision-making table that then led to the catalyzation of all these different projects, new affordable housing that people were advocating for, transportation plans, shade equity, environmental justice issues, because the park really was just the starting point for this. And it turned into this like community network of impact that then has this life of its own within the, within the Coachella Valley. And so while it started with that one green space, it has blossomed into this larger set of projects on the ground that people are now like at the decision-making table and arguing for. So I hope that that gives a little bit of a taste of the type of work I do, maybe spurs some ideas about how that could um, be applicable to the work y'all are doing at Lincoln Beach and really excited to dive into it a little bit more. Thank you. My name is Sarah Zodi. I am founding principal of Studio Zodi. We're a landscape architecture firm based in Harlem, New York, although I am originally from Slidell. Um, I wanna introduce two of my colleagues who are on the call, Phil Sievertson. Phil, you wanna say hi? Hey everyone, super excited to be here and be hearing everything about this. And we're curious. How's it going y'all? We're curious here. Nice to meet you all virtually. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in. So as I mentioned, our office is based in Harlem, New York. Um, you know, I grew up in Slidell and it was after the storm, I started to go to a lot of community meetings just like this one. And I felt like I really didn't understand the drawings or what was being said. And that's actually what inspired me to go study uh, city planning and landscape architecture. So I went and studied city planning and landscape architecture. And um, now I've started this firm um, where we work around the country, largely in historically black neighborhoods. Engagement is core to what we do, research and engagement. And because of that history that I come from of being a community member um, and so the practice has always been, our office has always done work centering that as the departure for everything that we do. And we take those voices and those ideas and the, that research and bring it all the way to the construction of landscapes um, all around the country. I, as I mentioned, I don't do this work by myself. We are a collection of landscape architects and planners and folks that come from studio art backgrounds and soil science and um, community organizing. It's all over the map in terms of um, the experiences that people bring to, to, the, to the office. And we work, as I mentioned, in a, a really wide range of landscape types and sizes and communities. So I wanna share, I was, I was gonna share two, I'm gonna make it three because I was inspired by the comments, but I will be quick. Um, this is a project uh, similar to this in the way that it was the community that really inspired the project and, and put pressure on the city, and in this case, the Parks Conservancy, to commission um, 
our office in developing a vision plan for this landscape. This is a 22 acre piece of the larger Fairmount Park in North Philly um, neighbor, in the neighborhood of Strawberry Mansion, historically black neighborhood. Our work started as it traditionally does with archival research. And we've you know, shared all these images with folks in the neighborhood and it really opened people up to working with us on um, understanding the generations long connection that people have to this park. One of the community members gave us this poem. It says, now I have seen monuments, great geometric heaps of stone, lifeless towers raised to keep alive the dead. But I ask, cannot a monument that breathes be built? So the idea of a monument that breathes became the whole framework for the project. In our first community engagement, we didn't come with anything drawn. You know, We wanted to hear directly from uh, the community members that made this project happen, what is important? What are the priorities? How, you know, how do we frame, how do we understand the project and how do we celebrate what it is right now before we talk about changing it? This neighborhood is known for its block parties. So we had a big block party and we hired folks from the community to cater it. There were rappers from the neighborhood that came out and performed about what they love about this place. We had t-shirt making and it was just a way to celebrate what it already is. And so people were thought they were at a party, you know, um, they were filling out these boards about, you know, what they love about this place, just like you're already doing in the chat here. And the 150 party goers at a certain point, we switched out the barbecue for these large aerial maps and the 150 party goers, we organized into six groups and they made a collective collage in their groups about what they love about this place. And they presented those back to the larger group. Uh, so we got to hear um, from people what is important to them. And that became the, the foundation for the vision plan. We took the six collages and we analyzed them, um, not as a kind of one, you know, literal one-to-one -one translation, but what are the large strokes with emerging themes? Across the six, we found three things that formed the basis of the design. So first is activating the edge of the park along the residential side of, of the street. Second was bringing people into the heart of the campus. And third was forming a really clear and legible circulation system. So we were able to share with folks who were at that first engagement event, how their collages were interpreted, their priorities were interpreted, how we synthesize them into three key things, and then how that sh actually shapes the structure of the design. So I'll just share a few of the renderings. Um, John Coltrane grew up facing the park. And so we took a sketch that he did and made it the paving pattern of what you see on the ground. So that became a place for inscriptions about people from the neighborhood and wayfinding. Uh, Meek Mill is from the neighborhood, so you see him in this rendering, but we heard a lot about family reunions. So we have a whole picnic grove just for the family reunions that we heard about. Um, and at the heart of the whole park is this water feature and plaza. On the water feature, we have inscribed the words of the poem about the breathing monument, because this is a place to celebrate the community, which is uh, the Breathing Monument. This is another project that is similar to Lincoln Beach in the sense that um, it is uh, on the waterfront and it has a lot of historic structures there. And people have been using the site for decades without the city really being involved. Um, so this place is called Graffiti Pier and this is Pier 18 and Pier 20 that were part of our site. Um, we were commissioned uh, because there were so many people coming to the site. Uh, it became a liability issue. And so they hired us to develop a plan um, for the site. Essentially graffiti was invented in Philadelphia and this site had a lot to do with it. So graffiti writers and street artists are passionate about this place. And the first, you know, as soon as they heard that landscape architects were involved, they were like, shut it down. We don't want this to be designed. You know, there's nothing you can do to make this better. Um, and so that was the context that we were working with. What we came to, pitch to, to everyone is we said, we in this case where people are criminalized for their use of the site and criminalized for the beauty that they brought here, um, you know, we need to respect that. And we so we said our public engagement is not gonna be public. We're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with graffiti writers. In some cases, they sent representatives to us, um, but we really wanted to honor the legacy of, of their relationship to this place. So what we, this is a picture from one of the you know, meetings that we had um, with the graffiti writers. One of the things we wanted to share with the graffiti writers is, look, if we do nothing here, this site is going to fall victim to the, the rising sea level. 
And so this is actually your chance to save Graffiti Pier. So it became a Save Graffiti Pier project. All the graffiti writers that we asked, um, that we met with, we asked them the same question. We said, what is the best thing that can happen here? And what is the worst thing that can happen here? And we mapped all of those onto this chart and found, if you see all the best things are on the untouched side, just don't touch it. And all the worst things are that it feels like a new park. Um, and so from that, we said, okay, we understand some emerging themes from here. And does this, is this, this is what we heard, does this resonate? We said, okay, if we do these four things, then we are honoring those conversations, ensuring the continuation and expansion of art, keeping the site vegetated and passive, making it safe and accessible without looking safe and accessible and keeping it gritty. So throughout the vision plan, we came back to the community of graffiti writers and said, here are all the ways that each one of those four is incorporated into the site design. So for instance, keeping it gritty, one of the graffiti writers was like, you know, we want rocks and mud and water and plants. And so that really dovetails with the historic marsh that this site was. So we proposed restoring this historic marsh, which serves a lot of ecological services as well. During the vision plan, we came back with some early renderings to the graffiti writers and they literally tagged onto the renderings, their feedback. And so we decoded all their tags and work that back into the design as we develop the vision um, further. We develop these site furnishings custom um, to serve as these large surfaces for more art making. And our, you know, the with the pandemic, our engagement had to really um, change form. And so we we made a zine with the graffiti writers. We were communicating with them through the mail. Um, and they would just send us images of the graffiti they were making. We would send back the drawings, and that's how we worked through the engagement during COVID. I'll end this part with just a few before and afters. A lot, so this is a $26 million construction budget. You can compare that to the $24 million at Lincoln Beach. And it cost that much money to basically keep it looking the way it did. A lot of that being structural issues, a lot of that just upgrading the surfacing and the planting. So this is before and this is after. So, um, you know, we found the historic rail details and incorporated that. You see the marsh and you see the um, ADA pass. So this is before and this is after. This is selective removal of invasive species, bioswale upgraded um, surfacing to make this universally accept, uh, accessible. This is before and this is after. Same idea, we're replacing some of the planting to make it more robust and more resilient. Upgraded surfacing. Um, this is before, this shady pocket under one of the trestles, and this is after it's interpreting, reinterpreting that into a shade garden. And you see our site furnishings there. This is before, and this is after. What you see on the ground is actual coal from when this was a coal chute. We originally removed that and the graffiti writers were like, no, we want the coal. That's a big part of the experience here is coming to the site and coming, leaving with coal all over your, your clothes. So we kept it. Um, this is before, this is atop the trestle. They said, whatever you do, don't make it look like the High Line in New York City. So what we did was we introduced an ADA accessible ramp to the top, grasses, sedums, gravel, uh, and even the seating looks like it was always there. Uh, and then there's part of the pier that's falling into the water right now. So we worked with our engineers to design a new seawall that protects uh, the, the pier, but also serves as additional art walls. So um, this is a rendering of that portion of the site. Now I'll end with this one. This reminds me of Lincoln Beach in a lot of ways because it's about reconnecting this community to the water that it historically was connected to. This is the Strawberry Mansion Reservoir. And this reservoir was built in the 19th century at a time when people were building water infrastructure to serve as a civic amenity. And when uh, people were migrating north to Philadelphia, the, basically the Harlem of Philadelphia grew to grow a very strong connection to the reservoir. It was where everybody used to hang out and all of the high school sports and all of the first kisses and all of that happened here at the reservoir. And over many decades, the reservoir was fenced. They were restricted, their access, it basically increased their um, disconnection from the water and 
I saw Shanti's comment in the in the chat that you know a, a lot of people you know don't know the reservoir themselves. They only know the stories from their parents. I myself had only heard about Lincoln Beach until I went recently. So our our work here started with oral histories, just hearing what people know about what this place is. And we found remnants of those histories um, at the site. So we made a scrapbook of all of those histories that we heard. That was our first engagement. We said, we, we wanna share these stories with people. So we made a big foldable poster with a, a community scrapbook of all of those stories we heard about the reservoir. And we had street teams um, you know, going throughout the neighborhood to share these histories. Here's our street team. And we asked everybody as we were handing these out, one question, what if we could spend more time by the water? What, what, what would you do there? These were the responses. I'm going to actually let this video tell the rest of the story of what we, of our um, engagement and design here, because we were able to capture um, the work. We had a reunion with the reservoir. People had to be reunited with the with the water in order to even engage the idea of what could it possibly be. So I just want to say that a lot of those pictures did uh, remind us of Lincoln Beach, especially the uh, the ones with the graffiti. Um, so some of those pictures look like it could have actually been a picture of Lincoln Beach. It's crazy. I want to say just before we turn it over to uh, Wagner and Ball that some of the folks on this call are part of teams that are applying in response to the RFQ. Um, this in no way is any kind of, this is not related to RFQ process. Everyone who's on this call is contributing to support community capacity. This is not an audition. This is, this is nothing like that. Um, I hope from these presentations, we all see like we already know community engagement cannot just be a PowerPoint presentation uh, where somebody's talking at you. So I think from these examples, at the very least, we know the bar the bar is going to be set very very high, regardless of who 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 who's able to work on the project. So, um, John, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, and thank you for the other presenters. That was truly something. That was inspirational. Um, I don't know how we can follow that. We're, um, I'm Andy Sternad. I'm an architect and a planner. I'm with Wagner and Ball. We're based here in New Orleans. I'll turn it over to my colleague, John, in just a moment. Uh, but we specialize in, in designing and living with water. We're architects, engineers, planners. Um, this presentation is more about the technical details of the forces of water. So we took a little bit different approach to share with you um, how some of our work in New Orleans and elsewhere works with water and works with the, the many forces of water, especially in coastal environments. Um, and we know that communities can't make decisions without knowledge. Communities have to have knowledge about the environment and the forces of water within it. And that's where we begin. So I wanted to share, um, let me share my screen. We'll go very quickly through a lot of information um, and be happy to further discuss in, in the breakout space. Can y'all see that? Okay, great. I'll hand it over to John. Thanks, Andy. Hey, everybody. When we start anything, we ask ourselves, do you know where you are? And if you're in the middle of the city, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that we're in a coastal place. Uh, when we take this map and actually take away everything that's right at sea level, you start to see that pretty, pretty, pretty acutely. Um, gray is anything above sea level, purple is below, and red are the levees that protect us. And in this map, we start to think that we're in this concrete island at the edge of the world. And how did we get here? I think that's part of the story too. Um, yes, it's the forces of water, but it's also the, the way that we as humans respond to them and work with them or against them. So some of us on this Zoom call, depending where we are in the city, actually would be on land, as we would define it, 4, 000, 4, uh, yeah, 4,000 years ago. But many of us would not be. This, it was a chain of barrier islands in the past. And some of that sand, is, you can still dig that up in Gentilly. It's pretty close to the surface out there. It's kind of an amazing thing, these ancient islands buried under our, our city. Um, but that, as the river changed, that was another force of water shaping um, the city, the, the, the chef mentor, the lion chief, uh, moving through the city, shifting every, every uh, thousand years or so. And 
as permanent settlement began to develop on the high ground um, it, that follows the river, the sediment deposited by the river. Um, we, the high and low ground was really where people were. And as we moved into the, through, through the centuries into where there was kind of permanent colonial settlement as we would define it now, um, you start to see those patterns start to become codified and people are responding by digging drainage canals and, and starting to deal with the edge uh, at the lake quite differently. And it wasn't really until the 20th century when we are really draining the city uh, was that line between land and water hardened. Was It wasn't a really strict line before, but as, as we drain uh, stormwater away to, to make life possible as, as permanent settlement in, uh, expands into lower parts of the city, that also drains out groundwater. And so huge swaths of the city on soils that are prone to settle uh, become uh, much lower. So parts of our city are, are, as we all know, very low below sea level. And that's a response to lots of forces of water, to rainfall, to groundwater. And that, when you're, when you're dealing with living on the edge somewhere, uh, you really have to deal with all these forces of water. And so what we have today is a city that's taking it from all sides. We've got storm surge that's increasingly uh, uh, extreme as sea level rise occurs. We've got rainstorms that are that are more extreme than ever before. And we've got groundwater kind of lacing through everything. And so how we deal with uh, all of these forces, it's, it's, it's most profound at the edge where water is the most powerful. And so this is one response to those forces of water, but this is not really a response that leaves much room for people. And so we think that it, it's powerful to understand the forces of water, but it's, it's really more powerful to be able to deal with them in a way that still allows access, still allows beauty and some joy at the edge because we're in a city where we don't see a lot of water. It's very special uh, when we can find a place where water is visible, where it's present, uh, where we want to be by the water. And so we suspect that the future of, of our edges is a bit maybe more like these cypress trees where they're strong, they can exist in or outside of the levees. Um, but I think this is a place I want to be. You know, I don't want to be in that concrete wasteland. And so these forces have, we, we, have to, we have to design for them, we have to understand them, but we have to allow for ways to deal with them that still allow this experience. I think I'm going to hand it over to Andy. There you go. Thanks, John. So as we think in a little bit more specific terms about what water levels we're dealing with and what elevations we're dealing with, um, outside the levee is a really intense environment. That's something that uh, I think all of us are familiar with in different ways. Um, but the water gets pretty high out there from storm surge especially. And that's projected to increase in the future. Here's a photo back from 2012 in Isaac on Lakeshore Drive. And you see what kind of um, dynamic environment these places outside the levee are subject to what kind of change and force. And so how do we design places that can sustain themselves in these types of environments? Um, one way to think about it is through multiple lines of defense. So um, we can think about different layers in the landscape from the coast all the way into the city, different elements of marsh, barrier islands. We can also think about that at the scale of a site. So what are different lines of defense we can put in place to sustain even a single site? Um, in our environment around Lake Pontchartrain, we also need to think about salinity and sediment. And so when the river's high and they open the spillway, that lets a whole bunch of fresh water into the lake and changes the ecology. That needs to become a design criteria then for any kind of adaptation or proposal with, that, that, is, that is touching the lake. Um, and all these yellow areas you see are, are dirt. That's dirt movement across the city. That's moved around to elevate buildings, to build berms and levees. Um, to keep us safe, but also, like John said, to provide, uh, in the best case, provide ways to still get to water. So what does that look like in practice? I'll show you just a couple more pictures from New Orleans, and then we'll show two case studies uh, quickly around the country projects we've worked on. Um, that could look like living shorelines here. This is Bucktown in Jefferson Parish. Um, this is the Bucktown Marina. There's a piece here of existing living shoreline already built with a boardwalk, if you want to go see what that looks like. You can go, uh, this is right across 17th Street Canal. You can, you can park and see that boardwalk and living shoreline. And there's a proposal to extend it. So this is buffering that incredible force of water from storm surge at the lake, but allowing habitat to build in behind it. 
at this coastal edge, how do we think about structures and infrastructure adapting? We think about floating structures, things that can rise up, docks that can rise all the way up those poles, or infrastructure that needs to be hardened and raised. Um, so elevation, what is that critical elevation of the site um, thinking farther into the future? Um, but besides sea level rise, and something Sarah alluded to, uh, besides storm surge, what Sarah alluded to sea level rise, um, it's not just rising water, it's also sinking land. That's something we also know pretty well in New Orleans. We're below sea level, we're still sinking because we're not managing water properly. So that makes the sea level appear to rise faster in our landscape here. Um, that sea level rise has already been recorded in Lake Pontchartrain over the last hundred years, and it's projected to get faster in the future. So this is uh, data from NOAA, from the federal government about sea level rise projections. You can see looking back to the era that Lincoln Beach was open and active, um, sea level from 1939 uh, all the way up to the present day has already risen about two feet at the Lincoln Beach site. Um, if you just look at the date that the uh, Lincoln Beach closed, 1965, um, sorry, or, uh, I don't know what these dates are doing here, but uh, Lincoln Beach closed, access close to the public, we've already risen about a foot. So the site has already undergone sea level rise. It's already experienced that sea level rise, but it's projected to speed up. So what does that mean now? How do we design for a scenario with higher water levels to protect amenities uh, and to protect community use? That's something I think the community needs to advocate for and be, and be aware of in the design process moving forward. So uh, you see just two notes here. This is, this is the Lincoln Beach site. Here's dry land across Hain Boulevard. Here's like Pontchartrain. Around half of the site is projected to be underwater by 2060, just from sea level rise. And almost all of the site is projected to be underwater by 2100 in about 75 years from sea level rise. So as what does that mean for how we begin to take a step to anticipate that future? So two, two projects real quick. This one is in Norfolk, Virginia. This is a completed project. Um, this is along a river that's connected to the Atlantic Ocean. So they see a lot of the same forces of water that we experience here from storm surge to high rainfall, surface runoff, and importantly, groundwater and sea level rise. Uh, this is the neighborhood right here in the foreground. One way they're approaching that in Virginia is by thinking about it in stages. So importantly, they've taken 2050 and 2070 and decided that they're going to design for certain targets at those years. So they're not thinking to the 2100. They're not thinking about the extreme case. They're just thinking about how can we take a first step and how can that first step be built on over time? Uh, so this was actually a $120 million project, but split into pieces. Uh, it includes a coastal berm, sort of like the levees we see in New Orleans, but it includes stormwater management on the inside too. And that's really important. We'll talk about freshwater and saltwater again in a minute, um, but we think about these systems as a whole. So even though a site like Lincoln Beach is mostly outside the levee, the areas inside the levee play a role and they're connected. They're connected hydrologically. Um, so this Ohio Creek project in Norfolk, Virginia includes that coastal berm that's finished. It includes some stormwater management inside, but it includes more access to the water. And that's something uh, we're not speaking about community processes associated with these projects and focusing more on the science. Um, but that was one of the high priorities that came out of this work is finding a place to both finding a way to protect communities from high water levels, but also maintain access. Um, on the outside, there's multiple lines of defense. So living shorelines, allowing marsh to rebuild behind uh, coastal protection. That's something that can almost keep pace with sea level rise, depending on how it's built. And then some infrastructure like pump stations uh, to help manage that interface of water. Uh, so last example from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, this is a coastal park, a Frederick Law Olmsted coastal park is only coastal park in the country. Um, it's a historic landscape. There are big trees and it was impacted by Hurricane Sandy in 2012. So we've worked with the city of Bridgeport to develop a proposal to protect Seaside Park moving into the future and integrate stormwater management in this district. So the orange line, you see a little tail piece of levee there, a storm surge berm. The parks at the edge and stormwater management inside. All of these factors work together as a system, um, including some offshore features, some berms, these kinds of multiple lines of defense. Um, some of them are really hard. Some of them are, are straight up concrete walls, but we're always looking for ways to integrate people, make them places for community. 
Um, and some things need to uh, be raised to maintain site functionality. So infrastructure and roads, um, if you can't get to the site, if you can't continue to get there, what's the point of, 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 of sustaining it? Um, but this is maybe a hard drawing to understand, but the key point of the whole park, we're redirecting the stormwater uh, runoff in the city of Bridgeport in the South End into the park instead of Long Island Sound. So fresh water doesn't need to be pumped into the ocean. It needs to be pumped into the park. The reason is as sea levels rising and this landscape is getting saltier, the fresh water can help maintain those big trees. So by putting fresh water into the park instead of the sound, we can help the landscape sustain itself and continue to grow over time. So the community can continue, continue to use it. This is the location where, this, where stormwater actually goes through the levee. You can't see it, but it's turning into a public space place for access and a place to celebrate where that water moves back into the landscape. I have the breakout room set up. You can choose whichever one you want to go in. Room one will be focusing on community capacity and stewardship uh, with Lauren Elashi from KDI. Um, room two, memory and storytelling and planning and design with Studio Zudi. And room three, if you're interested in digging more into the forces of water with John and Andy, um, this is the, each room is just an open space for questions, for dialogue, for all of us to build shared knowledge. And again, we'll take notes and compile all the notes so that if you miss one room, um, you still have a chance to catch up um, through the notes. Bliss is going to close us out, tell us how to get involved, how to support New Orleans for Lincoln Beach. I think at the end of the day, um, a community that's as organized as this, um, working together can really, uh, none, of, none of the creative work that you see happens without um, activists like you all showing up and demanding there be a better community engagement process, demanding that their voices and histories be, be heard and be part of any formal process. Um, so I think, yeah, Bliss, tell us, tell us what, what we need to do to support New Orleans for Lincoln Beach and make sure there's a strong community voice. Um, not just this year and with the master plan, but in the years ahead. Right. Okay. So I put our um, social media in the chat, uh, New Orleans for Lincoln Beach on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, which is a, uh, you have to become a member. We also have a blog. So I know it gets confusing sometimes for the people who've been a member. Um, I just did that blog so that I can uh, get public information out. Um, also, we're on Instagram, New Orleans underscore four, underscore Lincoln Beach. But, um, and we have a, a website, neworleansforlincolnbeach.com. But we have a Lincoln Beach Community Advisory Committee meeting. It's going to be a Zoom meeting. It's a public meeting, August 3rd um, at six o'clock. That's a Thursday. And uh, we're going to put the Zoom link in, in the, uh, gonna put the Zoom link on all the social media, plus we're gonna mail it out. So if you want to, um, be on the mailing list and you're not on the mailing list, DM us or uh, you can email me at uh, New Orleans for Lincoln Beach at gmail.com. We try to keep everything. <laughs> I know it's long, but at least you know it's us. Uh, so yeah, uh, we're going to start having some in-person socials, but I just kind of want to get feedback from everybody or what's a good uh, time I know after work is a good time but it just like good area or maybe we will rotate where we where we meet I just want to get everybody I want to talk to everybody we want to talk to everybody so that we can start uh formalizing our committees and uh start meeting having these committees meet and report back so we don't have to be everywhere every time Does anybody have any questions before? Liz, what should people expect at the community advisory commit, uh, meeting? So, okay, um, at the community advisory committee meeting, we, so first of all, that, that committee is, um, the mayor has two appointees, um, which one is active right now. Um, Co Councilman Oliver Thomas, who's uh, the beaches in his district, District E, um, he appointed two people and we had we appointed three people. So um, Sharon Robles usually gives an update, um, who's the project manager over the development of Lincoln Beach. She gives an update and uh, 
we just really talk about what's on the table at the time and take any questions. Uh, we, we would love for people to submit questions uh, prior to the meeting. That way we could address it at the meeting, but that's usually how that works. Uh, New Orleans for Lincoln Beach has kind of been going to everybody else's meetings <laughs> and, and regrouping and, you know, we kind of, so we, what we're trying to do is reel it all in. But at that particular meeting, it's a Zoom meeting, it's usually about 30 to 45 minutes. And it, it definitely is um, a place where you can come and ask questions and have your questions answered, or we'll let you know that we'll answer them within a certain amount of time, depending on how tasking it is. <laughs> Bless you, I'll close this out. <laughs> yes, I will. So y'all, I wrote this song um, about Lincoln Beach <laughs> and about us <laughs> uh, in 2020. So I'm gonna do it a cappella. And here we go. Um, there is no question because this is God led. They cannot touch it no matter what they said. We didn't start it, but we're going to end it. The good resolution, we found a solution. Mm -mm. Call me revolutionary. I prefer resolutionary. I'll be on the beach, chilling with my peace. Caring for your feet, you know me. You can count on me. I got what you need. And baby, so do you. Put your skills to use. Use up all the juice. Don't let it go to waste. Right time, right place. We can change today. We got what it takes. Hear what I say. And there is no question because this is God led. They cannot touch it no matter what they said. We didn't start it, but we're going to end it with good resolution. We found a solution. It's about you, Sage. <laughs> Call him revolutionary. He prefers resolutionary. He'll be on the beach caring for the trees. Always on the scene, know what I mean. Wait long, you will, you and Rich, get to see him chill. Cause he ain't got no chill. Cause this thing is real. And there is no question because this is God led. They cannot touch it no matter what they said. We didn't start it, but we're gonna end it. With good resolution, we found a solution. I see. <laughs> Resolutionary. <laughs>